the first one is sole proprietorship. I mean, most of my work is representing bands, musicians, uh, which cover the gambit from everyone from kids groups to, you know, like the Imagination Movers to funk acts like Galactic to rappers like Cupid. So kind of, you know, anywhere in between, I guess, generally. I also do film work um, and, you know, occasionally I do book deals and that kind of stuff. But me and basically three of the lawyers in my firm, that's basically all we do. So let's see, on entities, there's basically um, one, two, three, there's at least uh, four that are kind of readily available. Uh, one is a sole proprietorship, which is just basically a DBA, meaning doing business as. So uh, there's really no difference between that and just uh, you kind of hang out your own shingle. Uh, what's the big disadvantage there is that there's no liability protection. So that means uh, essentially if um, you're married, let's say, not to make it too confusing, in a community property state and you infringe on someone's copyright, then they can sue you, they could get all your assets and in a community property state, unfortunately get your wife's assets uh, short of some protective things like maybe your house and your tools of your trade and that kind of stuff. Um, so generally, uh, with at least the bands at my level, um, they may start off as a sole proprietorship but very few, well, none of them really operate as a sole proprietorship. I guess the, the one story I can tell you that kind of brings this all to light was a newly formed band that came to my office to sign an operating agreement for an LLC, had rented a van, went on tour, and the time they got to Mississippi had killed somebody. So, um, now, unfortunately for the band, the lawyer in Mississippi had heard of my alleged reputation and thought, well, this is going to be the next big hit group out there. <laughs> so he was very interested in like what their future held and all that. So, uh, but we worked it out nonetheless. Um, but had they not had that protection, you know, I mean, each guy had cars and houses and, you know, the like. So they could have kind of gotten to all those assets. So they're all personally liable. Yeah, they would all be personally liable, uh, arguably forever. You know, you can get a judgment and you can enforce it every or renew it every ten years, depending on what state you're in. Um, but you know, that that's certainly the the disadvantage. It's uh, you know, as an entity, it would just as a DBA. I mean, it's basically like a, a pass through, and. Um, some states require, not Louisiana, but they require then you register it as a fictitious name, like in California, for instance, uh, you would have to register a certificate. Um, some states require that just if you do business in that state, like let's say Galactic tours a lot, so they have to register in that uh, California or Tromo Chordi's another client of mine, so we'd register just as doing businesses in, in that state, but we'd represent, uh, register his, his LLC or his Inc. The, uh, I guess the next entity is a partnership. So that would be um, two or more people. Um, this one gets a little tricky because a lot of people uh, essentially are, have an unwritten partnership, which that doesn't really do you any good, kind of get you back to a sole proprietorship. Um, I don't really do, I don't use a, the partnership vehicle because again, um, basically the rule there is each partner would have an undivided interest unless you put it in writing that it would be something else. Um, they also have the problem of unlimited liability, albeit the rule there says you have to get all the assets of the partnership first before then you can go to the, end, the actual partner. Um, you can kind of try to change those rules in writing, but you know, that's, not, that's going to be limited. I mean, you could say he's responsible for 90% of any, any problems. Um, you know. Yeah, you can have, you, there's a, to make it a little more complicated, you could have a limited partnership, which does have um, uh, liability protection, but I would probably advise you against doing a partnership um, and just going to the new world, which is more of an Inc. or an LLC. So I guess the, the debate of uh, which one do you use out of the two. Um, the first thing I could tell you is there are some very specific rules, like for instance, one artist I represent is Anders Osborne. Uh, 
when I signed Anders' deal with Sony, Anders forgot to mention to me he was an illegal alien at the time. Uh, and of course that came to light after he started getting a lot of press and INS called me to, he had to tell me he was on the lam, I guess. So I had to figure out how to deal with that situation. But um, when we then formed the entity for him, um, one rule was a, let's see, a, a S Corp would allow a resident alien, okay? So once he got, you know, his papers and all that stuff. Uh, at the time, as an LLC, it was unclear whether or not a resident alien could be in an LLC. <laughs> I think the biggest uh, plus of uh, LLC versus Inc. is that in an LLC, you can have actually uh, corpor incorporated entities as your member. Uh, with a, a subchapter S Corp, you can't have another corp as your entity. So, you know, sometimes bad things happen to bands, like uh, a local band that's breaking up finally, the Radiators. Um, you know, there's this rule in rock and roll, like the last guy in is first guy out. Well, I represented the last guy in that, that group. So they booted the guy, and he kind of wanted some sort of severance. So we were thinking of fun tax things we could do to jack the band around, right? So one was he could sell his, his shares. What I thought we, we could do is divide all his shares, and we could sell them to fans, right, so they could go to their annual shareholder meeting with the radiators. How fun. Um, but also it busts their S status, so then they'd, they'd be forced to go to a C status, which is subject to double taxation. They're taxed twice. And that would probably move the ban on giving him some severance and getting him out of the ban, which actually did work. So... Um, you know, the, but I guess the two the two entities as far as uh, liability shields uh, are the same basically. Um, one problem I have seen is that people do form LLCs um, and they don't do an operating agreement. The operating agreement just basically the statute doesn't really say what it all has got to say. It just says that you got to have one. But basically, it's the duties and rights you know that that uh, govern how the the thing is to run. Um, and so if we go to an ink, I can explain that. There's two types of ink, which I mentioned. One is a closely held corporation, which is a S Corp. Most of my bands, if they're not an LLC, are S Corps. Uh, the main rule there is you can't have another corp as a shareholder if you want to be an S Corp. If you're a C Corp, that's like more like Coca-Cola and those kind of things. They are subject to double taxation, which means they pay taxes. You know, once a corporation pays taxes and then to the member when it flows through, they would pay taxes. Um, so I don't really, uh, I don't have any S corps, and even I do work for Dave Matthews, for instance, and even his, he has, he, Dave operates out of 25 different corporations. So that means like every time he sneezes, they form an ink. So he has like a merch company, a ticketing company, a publishing company, a royalty company, and each one has a different company, maybe even album by album, if they're licensing them, those will all be entities. And the idea is that, you know, if you sue this one, you can't get to this one, so long as they don't commingle things and all that, but they're, they're good about keeping things very divided. Um, the Inc. Um, is run by the board of directors that's elected by the shareholders, right? And the, um, basically, the bylaws would specify kind of what powers the board is given and usually the role is the day-to-day -day management would be done by the board and then if anything of significance like um, uh, getting a debt let's say taking a bank loan then you'd have to go to the uh, members in, or the shareholders and get their approval um, that's kind of how the, I guess one big advantage is I guess I didn't say on a partnership generally a partnership is over when someone dies or leaves so a corporation can obviously transcend the shareholder's death. So that when you're in a band, you're like four of the guys that you're in the LLC with those guys, and therefore there can be a partnership element. Well, I mean, an LLC is treated like a partnership, basically, tax-wise, uh, but it is a different entity, which is a limited liability company. Um, so that's kind of how it works. The, the LLC, basically, instead of shareholders, you have members. Um, there's two types of LLC. One is where it's member run, which would be like uh, a situation where, let's say, I guess every band always has one guy that has to deal with me, right? There's one kind of business guy in the band. 
Um, that's always a suck job. Uh, but he has to deal with the manager, the agent, and the lawyer, basically. So some of them set up where the managing member, who basically runs day-to-day -day operations, makes day-to-day -day decisions, he, he's the managing member. The other ones are member-run, which means you got six guys, and, you know, you decide what the vote's going to be, majority, supermajority, or unanimous consent. It means all of them are involved in every decision. So a group like the Imagination Movers, for instance, they're all very actively involved in like every decision. Uh, other bands like, let's say, Galactic, uh, none of the guys want to be involved in any of the decisions except they defer to one guy who basically kind of runs the show. Um, so, in, in obviously other bands, like let's say Trumbo Shorty, he would have a single member LLC where it's just him and then he hires in a band. So the band's actually not even part of the LLC. They're just kind of like the proverbial hard gun. Um, I guess the advantage of LLCs over inks, I mean, there are some, like I say, these technical requirements that you might want to look at to see, like for instance, one advantage of LLC is you could have a number of uh, subchapter S corps, which you couldn't in the ink world. That would be an advantage. Uh, I don't know what the, the resident alien, if they caught that, IRS has caught that rule yet. Uh, I think they have. So there's, there's some advantages, I think, generally on the paperwork side, which is that, you know, you can now do a quarterly return rather than, let's say, a monthly, which might be due on a subchapter S, um, you know, 941 tax payments every month, and you could just do quarterly ones. Um, so I think the Generally, I think the paperwork uh, in terms of a, a tax accounting uh, system is a little easier on the LLC. Um, and, you know, you can, of course, take on these incorporated entities as partners. That's an advantage. Um, and I think that's, that's primarily the, the only other one out there is like a joint venture, which would be like you could couple, let's say, a partnership with a uh, Inc. Um, kind of with the change in, in the record industry, that certainly has been a lot more common. Like I've done a lot more joint ventures with record labels now, where like, uh, well, Galactic, for instance, we have now a joint venture with uh, Anti, their label. Uh, we, we record, produce the master, they distribute, promote, and release it. So we have kind of a, if you will, a joint venture, a partnership with their, their uh, they're an ink, and we are, and Inc., I guess Galactic runs out of two entities, LLCs and Inks. I mean, I guess generally you hear about all these entities, but I guess kind of in the baby band status, you know, I recommend like one entity. Uh, I guess one test I always think about is when you go out and like rent a space, like who's going to sign the, the rental space, right? Or if you're going to start renting vans and that kind of stuff or tour buses and all that. To me, that's kind of a good liability light that goes off in your head, like, are you going to sign personally for the band? Or are you going to make everybody sign personally? Um, and obviously, that's you know, is you know, I mean, I've been involved in more like ODs than you want to hear at venues where they, of course, blame widespread panic or whoever else, you know, um, you know. So, uh, but you know, again, they're looking at well, who, who was booked? Was it widespread panic or was it widespread panic's touring Inc., which is what it was? Um, and then they only can go after their tour revenues versus, versus their record revenues or whatever else. Um, I think that's largely the entities. What about the, uh, the band agreement? Yeah, I was going to say, to me, the, the band agreement, I mean, I think getting this done, that's easy, you know, or you have a... Sure. Uh, this one or... Test, test, how about that? Yep, there you go. I'll read John's notes out loud to you here. Um, so the band uh, agreements part, now this area is really, at least in my world, matter of fact, today I got a kind of dicey call about, you know, potential injunction against one band, but I guess the issues I see here, um, which are all kind of litigation oriented, or Okay, one, who owns the group's name? Trademarks, service marks, and all that. 
both in and out of the band. So in other words, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, if it depends on how you set it up. So this has been just totally fraught with problems. For instance, let's see, one famous case, I guess, is Salt and Pepper. You remember that group? You can't forget Salt and Pepper. Right, I mean, you can't. Well, they can, they can forget the name because the three girls, of course, unfortunately have to l rent the name from the manager who owns the name, who, has, who of course, is long fired. So, um, there's, I mean, continual situations I deal with where I just dealt with one for the givers where it's like, you know, they have that one guy in the band that like, oh, he's going to help and do the paperwork. And then, of course, I realized that he's registered the corporation only in his name, all the copyrights only in his name. Now he's od twice on tour and we want to get rid of him. Okay. And oh, wait, daddy's a really wealthy lawyer. So... Welcome to my world, you know? So then it's like, oh shit. And oh, wow, we just got a major record deal, great. So it definitely can create lots of problems. And the first problem is like, who's gonna own the name? So um, this is kind of a tough situation because I guess depending on, you know, obviously if it's your own name and there are cases about this, right? So if it's, uh, you know, there's, there's a big case on, I guess, Creedence Clearwater Revival about group name ownership, there's a, Blue Oyster Cult one. There's there's a lot of group name litigation, I guess. But obviously the name has a lot of value. The Doors went on tour last year, or the new Doors, depending on before or after the lawsuit. Um, but generally, the way I set it up is we'll have the ink, okay, so then we have a shareholder agreement or a managing member agreement, and we basically say, you know, it's kind of a rolling the dice, but if it's a, it really truly a situation where it's not one person, like, you know, Anders Osborne, that's actually his name. It's actually not his name, really, but, um, so you have rights to your own name, and the cases basically say that, so they can't block you from not using your own name. So that we got actually litigation on that topic, uh, but then you have these weird names that are made up, like Jay Giles, I guess. I don't think there's a Jay Giles, right? Uh, then who gets that name and who can use it? Um, so sometimes, like, the Cars have a new record, which I think was okay this round, but, you know, you have one dead guy and whether or not his estate wants them to tour under that name. Um, so usually the way I set it up is, you know, essentially majority rules. Now, you ask what happens when there's four people, you know, it gets complicated, right? Um, but usually what I say is the majority of the active performing members get the name. So... I guess everyone can look around the room if there's four people and say, okay, who's the first guy to go? Well, he's not going to get the name. Now, if two people leave and two people remain, um, that's when it becomes a problem. Maybe the two people that remain actually want to perform under the group's name, but these other two may say, well, wait, we own part of it, so you're going to have to rent or license the use of our interest in the name. Um, I guess the problem I often get into is that when we have an X member and we don't have rules about how to get rid of one or how to add one, then whoever gets thrown out then tries to block the use of the name, which is now currently what I'm dealing with for the upcoming Jazz Fest because they know there's the group will book lots of gigs. Uh, but I think the easiest way to deal with it is since no one knows who that guy's going to be is just to let's establish the rules going in rather than on the back end. Because uh, usually I will tell you on the back end usually involves me and it also involves the band paying somebody money to get rid of them, you know. So I guess on these band agreements what's important is one, um, who's going to own the name, the logo, the service mark, the trademark. You know, maybe this majority rules or two-thirds or something like that would be, you know, some some idea of a way to go. Uh, the other issue is how do we get rid of somebody? Okay, that one cuts all ways too, right? You could be the guy that sucks. Let's say everybody gets a lot better. Let's say you are disabled. Let's say you're a drug addict. Let's say you are a. Let's see, I've had a drug addict guy who really likes prostitutes and gets arrested all the time, and he doesn't show up at gigs. You know, so you get a little flavor of all of it. 
And how do you just say, look, I've had enough. We've got to get rid of the guy. So, um, you know, I've basically, you know, usually kind of majority vote, you're out. And then also we establish what you get if you get it voted off the island. And usually what I do is in these band agreements, I, we say very clearly that the band name has no value, so we don't have to pay you anything. We'll pay you if, you're, if you've written songs or you have royalties, we'll pay you those in the future. Uh, as, to, as far as live gigs, if you're not in the band and you're not performing, you don't get paid. Um, yep. Why does the band name not have any value? Isn't that what they're... Well, it does have value, but I guess the issue here is, and this is kind of one of the age-old debates, is does the band name, I mean, short of like Little Wayne and Prince and Pink Floyd, if the band isn't really out there performing and touring, does it really have any value? And it may or may not, but if it doesn't have value, who's giving it the value? And it's the guys that are actively performing, right? So I guess the issue I get into is, okay, this ex-member that says, well, wait, I still want to be a wild, crazy, drug addict, arrested, you know, prostitute-loving guy, but I can't really perform well. Um, he still wants to play in the group, but he's just not he's not able to contribute, right? So I guess, and this is always controversial, getting the people to agree in advance to say like, look, if you're the guy voted off the island, then we're not gonna pay you for your interest in the name. If not, then I think basically, and I've done this before, is to create a formula which says, no, we're gonna pay you, you know, whatever, <coughs> some sort of licensing fee. Um, you know, it's just, it's a, I don't know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a risky, you know, because, I mean, if we're all in a band together right now and we, we think and we hope we're going to be successful, then how do we price the value of the group name in the future? And there's, there's plenty of ways we all can be, like, creative and say, well, maybe we, we link it into gross sales and it's some percentage of that. But, you know, it, it's just you can make this thing pretty complicated. So I guess to some degree we've thought, well, maybe the easiest thing is to say, if you get canned, you just don't get anything. Unless, of course, now the group can, through the kindness of its heart, say, look, you really were there for us and we want to pay you a severance. But we're just not going to get into a situation where we have to pay you uh, basically rent, you know, which is like with the door situation. That's, they had two, the, the estate of Jim Morrison, and I guess it was the drummer, uh, the drummer right? He, they blocked, the, they went out on tour with a new person who sucked, and then there was some litigation over that, then they tried to name, change the name to the New Doors, which then we can argue in the marketplace is causing market confusion and infringing on their copyright, which they did, and get into all that kind of stuff. Um, and you could try to misspell the name and do, you know, there's, you know, but it, it, it definitely, uh, it definitely can be, uh, problematic, you know. That's like, I guess, Prince, you know, with changing the name to the symbol was to basically try to get out, because he couldn't use that name Prince because he was signed to Warner Brothers. So then he created the symbol, right, and he could perform under that name. And you can always say, too, there's good cases that say, formally, the artist known as. Um, he made that law. There's also, I guess, in the Creedence situation, I think, Fogarty got that too, and maybe uh, the band. No, I guess it wasn't. Robbie got that, but you know, there's been there's been lots of litigation, obviously, over this group name. Because the truth of the matter is that people know the group name. So if you say X is playing a House of Blues, they may not inquire about who is X. So uh, you know, but um, so I think you know, getting some guidelines and rules about like who's going to own the name, how we're going to use the name. That's a good idea. How we get rid of a member, and of course, how we add a member is another kind of big controversy. Uh, and I've just found as a lawyer, I guess it's a lot easier for us to agree not knowing how this deal is going to play out. You know, If you are the guy in two years that's going to suck, you know, right now you might not know that. Everybody, might, everybody else might become a lot better. And I think people tend to advocate within their own self-interest. So a lot of times when it's a newly formed band, they don't realize like, oh wow, 
can't believe this, but in four years, I'm going to become a has-been drug addict, non-performing, no-show, and always being arrested and getting in fights, you know. Uh, that may not function like if you're, I represent Mavis Staples. In the gospel world, that might not be a really good sales point to Mavis. But um, so um, this definitely has been a big problem area for me, getting rid of people and adding people, how much, you know, especially usually the guy or girl doesn't leave without a fight, it seems like. So they always want to get like bought out or something. Um, it just seems like I think if you have the rules set, you know, uh, beforehand, then it does save a little problem on the back end. Yeah. I got another rap about this story. Say when, like, all right, say one member of the band is the founder of the band, right? Yeah. And then they, they form the band. Um, and then, but then they, it was not until they formed the band that they found the LLC. Yeah, then, right. But then the founder of the band ends up stuck. Correct. And yes. So you, I guess you're not familiar with my Davis Rogan, all that, the band fired Davis from his own band rule. Yeah. So the, this situation does come up, right? Um, so I'm dealing currently with that situation three, in three different matters. So one is a new member that's brought in. So one issue is like if there's not an agreement, like who owns the name when you were just kind of two dudes playing in a coffee shop? Like sometime it'll start with just, you know, two people who are playing, or like, let's say, uh, like the Kings of Leon, where a friend of mine who's a writer, like basically said, oh, you're good looking guys, you're the Rolling Stone record, why don't you just do some stuff like this, and you've become really successful. And he thought of the name, he wrote the songs, he produced the album. Um, so I mean, really, he's got just as much claim on the name as they do, frankly. So in those situations, usually when we do the band agreement, we say that, like, they might, these two guys are the original guys in the band. And maybe their contribution is the band name. The other guy's got to give them money. There's one way you can deal with it. Or maybe they at least acknowledge that whatever rights they had in creating the name, now they're all the corporations. And that's, that's you know, because currently, you know, and that kind of cuts both ways. I have a, a group where the newly, again, I guess he's subject to the rule of last guy in. I hadn't thought about that until now last guy in, because he is the last guy in, he's now been voted out. Of course, he's in the corporation, but he wasn't in the original corp, and he wasn't in the original group when they cre created the name. So, you know, I, I think, um, you know, just having some clear rules that say, hey, we all own the name now. Uh, and then maybe the, you know, maybe, you know, usually I make the, to get someone out of a group, you know, maybe that's like two-thirds or unanimous consent short of the guy being voted on, you know, because that's a, that's a pretty big deal, obviously, especially when it's a founder of the group. That always becomes a, yeah, I've had, yeah, I've had quite a few of those. And then there's always kind of a race to the copyright or service trademark office to then like, because they haven't registered the name and then the, 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 the new group goes and tries to steal the name from the founder because he hadn't gotten his paperwork done and all that kind of stuff. I mean, usually, um, I mean, usually, the LLC Inc. ownership. I usually split that equal with the number of members in the group, which then kind of leads to like the whole copyright world. Because then, it's good, I think, in this shareholder agreement or whatever you want to call it, membership agreement, to have like rules about who owns what in terms of the copyrights. If you have a label, then they own the master, so that's not a problem. But um, if you don't have a label, then who owns the record, right? Um, the actual, like, you know, <coughs> disc uh, with the sound recording. So it, that's a good document to say that, you know, the corporation maybe owns all the copyrights or maybe uh, each shareholder owns the copyrights or maybe some of the shareholder, shareholders don't own certain copyrights because then, you know, the typical thing is you might have a group and you have one guy who's a songwriter. So usually, uh, I guess I've kind of gone every direction on this. You know, it's like, does the songwriter, I've got overly generous guys 
who write all the songs and then they split it up equally in the group. And then I have other groups that, you know, say, okay, you wrote the count, uh, you know, call them the word counting groups, right? Who count words, melodies, and say, okay, you get, like when Galactic started, the splits are just, you know, Stanton, 17.5, Robert, 20.3, you know, and every one of them, every song was totally different. And then they slowly moved to, like, why don't we just all split it up? You know, the, the, I guess upside and downsides of this is if you do have one guy who really writes most of the stuff, most of the music, words or music, then maybe he's kind of getting shortchanged if he's not getting the majority share. Um, if you split it up equally, you might not motivate the lazy guy who doesn't really want to songwrite at all. Um, so, you know, I guess each group, it's different. Some of them, uh, it's a little bit of a mix or match. Some of them gravitate towards equal splits if they're all participating. Other groups, you know, where you might have a songwriter like, let's say, who do I have? Like Anders or Eric Lindell, they would always take 100% of the song unless somebody really helps and they'll cut them in on the song. You're talking about when you say split up, you mean the copyright or the money? Yeah, the copyright on this, but the money also too. Now you could be splitting, for instance, the money different than the copyright, right? Um, so the guy who wrote the song could keep the copyright, but they could share the income of the song. Yeah. And share the income of touring revenues too. So like most of my groups, no, I shouldn't say that either, but. Are they self-published? Or are they independent artists? But no, he's, he has a publisher. But, um, you know, a lot of groups uh, typically will split, if they are a true group, usually they tend to split the money, the touring revenue equally. Um, I guess unless it's a situation like maybe in the world of like Trombone Shorty where it's a front guy that he is the band and then he has paid guys, They're, those situations typically are, those guys might not be in the corp, which they aren't, uh, and they would basically get paid like, you know, almost like a session fee. So they're paid, paid so much per gig. Uh, and then he would get, you know, whatever, the remainder um, in those situations. Other groups might say, well, we're going to split it all, all the live income money evenly. Uh, and then if we have a writer, then maybe uh, we'll, um, the writer might get you know, all of his writer income, and then maybe we'll split the artist royalties equally amongst the group. So that, that's kind of how that works. Yeah. I thought you could split the copyrights. I thought that you could only do joint authorship or co authorship. I thought that you, you couldn't do fractions. Yeah, no, you can do fractions. You just have to, I think the important rule is that any copyright transfer it has to be in writing. So if you, there's going to be a split, then it's got to be memorialized. I thought initially, though, you could only do 100% of the mm. no? Yeah, you can write, you can, yeah, most songs are jointly written, you know. I mean, I guess, let me think of why you would think that. Maybe, I don't know why, really. You could, you could own 10% of the song, 12% yeah. of the song. I thought that was the song after it was published. Because I thought, like, when you write a song, you can either only solely be the sole writer no, that's not the case. You could uh, you could split both the writer side and the publisher side. You know, um, you can do that, and those splits don't actually have to be even. So you right? can split the writer share and the arbitrary numbers. Right. You can. Uh, I mean, some like I say, some bands I have will go to the point of like saying, "Okay, we're tired of, tired of counting words. We just." split it even, regardless of whether or not you were in the room or not, or whether or not you were involved. Because we're tired of, like, the fight. Like, I wrote the hook, and I wrote the, you know, like, in Nashville, like, Anders had to deal with Universal. Now he's uh, on Razor and Tie, but we're moving on to a new publisher. But in Nashville, everything is just, you know, if you show up in the room, it's just split 50-50. That's how they work. Right? Um, is that because it's union? I just think it's the easiest way. I mean, I guess over time, I, I've, I've kind of ascribed to this. Like, I remember one time I had a call from a lawyer. See how this strikes you. So my client, he comes up with the idea, okay, the whole idea of the song, the theme, 
in basically what the song is going to say, and then the hook. The other guy wrote the lyrics, but not the hook. So, like uh, Rolling Stones, I wrote that keyboard from Fire. That's basically right. What goes down. And so this guy's calling me, and he's an inferior writer, in my opinion, calling me to say, look, I don't think this 50-50 thing, which they agreed to is fair, it ought to be 25 your guy, 75 my guy. So I said, honestly, if you want me to go back to my client, fine, but one, He'll never write with him again, right? And my guy's written like a couple number one hits. He says, absolutely, go back to him. And it just killed that whole relationship for like, now they've, they've kind of patched it up. But, you know, and it's like, yeah, I mean, my guy didn't really, you know, line for line. I'm like, if we want to start counting words, I'll lose. Yeah, we're probably under 25%, but we got the hook, the whole idea of the song. You know, my guy's like, well, he just, he did the busy work is what he says, you know, so... Um, so it's always a, that's a little it's always a little dicey of how to what the fair thing to do is on all that but uh, I guess what I've done in these band agreements sometimes is we say that the publisher side might be owned by the ink or the LLC 100% and then maybe the writer side is owned by the shareholders and whatever percentages you want to say I could complicate things or not I don't, you know sometimes I've said uh, which I think is probably the easier and better approach in the LLCs or Inc. is just to say that the songwriting and the copyright ownership should be decided on a case-by-case -case basis and should be memorialized. So, you know, because things change over time, right? You might have two non-writing members that become prolific over time. Um, so, you know, that kind of gives you an out. It's just, I guess, you know, kind of you're in the beginning and you're like trying to get all the rules together and you don't, it, it's hard to decide what's the fair thing to do because it may be you end up having one guy that writes everything, you know, something like that. Uh, there's a uh, band that the, uh, the main guy started out completely by himself, recorded all his own instruments and vocals, and then got popular through the internet. Uh, got signed as a single unit. Right. Right. After two records, he was removed from the band, a new vocal was put in, mm -hmm. and they still toured rec and write, record under the same name. How, how would that break down legally and financially? Well, so I also deal with Disney, so this is one of the things they do, right? So the there was a group uh, that my daughter liked. Oh, there's two, I guess, I can think of. The Cheetah Girls. I'm sure that's, like, something everybody's been watching and listening to. So as I understand that entity, Disney owns the name, okay? And they own the group, basically. So what they do is they, they like, work for hire women to come and perform. This is the more brilliant kind of spin on this is the Blue Man Group, which can be touring with five or six Blue Man Group around the country because there's three guys, I believe it's three, that own the Blue Man Group and the concept and the name. But those guys now will hire a different Blue Man Group um, to perform around the country and no one can tell because they're all blue, right? They all look kind of the same to me. Uh, and they're all touring at the same time. So depending on how that's set up, which if it is a situation where like the Cheetah Girls uh, which is definitely something I really walked into with Disney with the Imagination Movers because that's kind of how Disney is used to operating. Like we own uh, the name uh, Miley Cyrus. They probably own Hannah Montana. <coughs> they definitely own Hannah Montana. So like I remember when the, her, the lawyer is a friend of mine and we were, I was doing my deal and he was, he was, what they were trying to do is introduce her as an artist. So they were trying to figure out ways and I think Disney had a license on the name, so, well, I guess they own the name outright, probably. And so he thought, well, could we do this kind of flip record where it's Hannah Montana and Miley Cyrus and then tour it as Hannah Montana and Miley Cyrus? The idea is to introduce you to Miley Cyrus because as of this year now, she's a goner, right? And now she wants to apparently smoke pot and tour as a rock band or something, right? Yeah, or Salvi, excuse me. Uh, so... 
Um, but yeah, that, you know, that's now the, the more kind of, kind of rigid technique is the cheetah girl thing where, you know, and that, that's kind of what I was living, where it's like one of these women starts saying something, they go, yo, you out of here. And also like High School Musical, if you remember that, they own that. Um, now those kids got totally screwed, each one of them. I kind of visited with a lot of lawyers because we were looking for a manager at the time. But, you know, they were just like signed on to do like some dumb Disney uh, made for TV movie, much like uh, Amanda Shaw, we did two of these. And then all of a sudden, boom, it blows up, right? Well, they got paid like $1,000 to do the show. And then they're like, we, w they have these writers who write all the music, so they don't get anything on that. Well, they own the name, they don't get any royalties. And then they're like, okay, now we're going to tour it. No, oh, by the way, we don't even need you guys uh, because we own everything, right? So, you know, then they all started trying to, you know, fight their way in. And then there are funny things about it, like Zac Efron apparently can't really sing. So I know that it took, which John would appreciate, took them 13 days to do one track, which I guess they just pro tooled to hell and back of having them sing, like, the same word for like a day, eventually they'll get one on key and then splice it together with, um, so I know that was the problem with, then he signed on to do a movie and demanded he sing for the, uh, what was the one with uh, Tom Cruise where he, uh, Footloose or whatever, he was gonna play that role and then they realized, oh my God, the guy can't sing, it's gonna take a month to record the, you know, one song or whatever. So he lost the part. But, uh, but yeah, that, that, this comes up because, you know, of course, you got to pay attention to what you sign. Um, mm. But if, you know, I could definitely easily see where, especially like, um, I remember when the internet, like when all these domain names and all that kind of stuff started, we as artist lawyers had lots of problems because the label wanted to own the artist's site, which essentially was his name. So back to that, like you always have the right to use your name. So then we're kind of thinking maybe we could always sue them on the rebound if it became a problem. But they wanted to, to uh, they all were putting in there that we own your, we own your website and we own it forever. Um, and so we all kind of pushed back on that. Uh, and now we'll tell you that at least we've been successful in most instances where you know, we do usually own our own website and our do domain name. Some instances, like Disney does make us give it to them during the term of the deal. Universal requires that too. Uh, because there's, you know, people have been able, like Hillary Duff's lawyer was telling me, because Disney has some really weird rules, like how many albums the artists can sell themselves. And I'm like, why would you care if we sell a lot? And my buddy's like, oh, we got him on that. He's like, you're gonna have to pay for that for me because Hillary Duff sold like 100,000 records off her website. You know, she made a lot of money. And they're like, oh, nope, in that, you know, we're gonna put a cap on it now, 30,000 records, you know. So they, you know, we kinda, that's basically what I do all day, I guess. Like, oh, let's try it this way. Nope, they got us, go back. All right. Yeah, no, I do. Um, sometimes I think of myself as a really expensive babysitter. Okay. Um, but my day-to-day -day job, um, I mean, I'm an I'm a entertainment attorney. So, you know, by the book, what I typically do would be I would negotiate your record deal. I would negotiate your management deal, your agent contract, your publishing deal. I do all this, your corporate work, that kind of stuff. But I guess as lawyers, we then negotiate with these labels, have lots of good contacts. So certainly, you know, I get lots of music from new kids that are gonna be the next big thing. I just went to South by Southwest. So we're kind of, as lawyers, looking for maybe the next big thing, or maybe my clients are sending me what they think are the next big things. So we do pitch stuff, you know, which is called shopping, I guess. Um, so I do, I do do that, you know, at my discretion of whether or not I think, you know, I believe that you are the next big thing. Um, but I don't, some lawyers act as managers and agents and, you know, I think all that involves lots of conflicts and is a problem. But typically what I like to do is just do the legal work, you know. But occasionally I do get a client that'll call me and say, 
while having sex in first class bathroom, I disabled the smoke detector and they have lots of cops now on me. So basically I'm the, when, when the shit passes the manager stage, then I get the call, you know, or juvenile, like I got busted smoking dope in Chalmette. I think these people are racist. I'm like, oh, no shit. <laughs> Um, so, uh, 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 so, uh, uh, so, you know, we are a little bit of the, the real problem solver on that. Uh, but I mean, usually what I'm normally doing would be negotiating the deal. I also do copyright infringement litigation. So, um, you know, I would do, you know, injunctions and copyright trademark service mark suits and all that. So. Both, I mean, usually, um, I guess more so I work hourly versus percentage, but some clients I'm on a percentage, yeah. Does that become like the fabric or is it? Yeah, I mean, that, again, that would be my discretion or the firm's discretion. Like, I mean, you know, like I get these vanity gigs, which are like three rich doctors that want to have a group. But if you're a rock group, you got to have an entertainment lawyer, right? Yeah. I'm like, put me on the payroll, you know. They, they got all the bells and whistles. They got a studio. They got this totally macked out studio that they record like once a year in. And then, but, you know, so on those, obviously, I wouldn't want a percentage because they never play. And whenever it is, it's bad probably, and no one would pay. So, obviously, I, I would not be uh, interested in a percentage there. Um, so, I would just charge them hourly. I always just assumed the Grateful Dead dropped the Grateful when Jerry died out of reverence, but you're probably telling me he was mm -hmm. a member and you yeah. didn't use the name after he died. Yeah, that was fraught with lots of litigation. Lots of friends were involved and theoretically wives and ex-wives and kind of wives and two chicks that claimed their wives and that stuff. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the dead... Uh, would be a compromised position. Because if you remember, there were all these other groups, you know, like kind of touring too, where it's like, okay, do, and again, maybe if you have that majority rule, then it's like, well, if we could just get three of them, Phil and two drummers, and they had like two drummers doing something, they're gonna have to call that something different. Um, I mean, sometimes they, people don't have a problem with it because it might uh, re, you know, like at South by Southwest, everybody's favorite Duran Duran is back. Uh, with the yeah. new record to boot, but I mean, you know, when they do, it, it does actually have all the, the guys that were originally in the group, but sometimes it's like two of the original members and three of the former roadies, right? And some people are just not down with that, because, it, but it will sometimes reactivate catalog sales and all that kind of stuff. You know, Devo was there last year, and they haven't had a record in like 20 years, and you know, all of a sudden new kids are getting hip to Devo, that kind of stuff. But definitely the, the name, you know, Obviously, too, you can see, like, booking a gig, I mean, are, are you going to go see The Dead versus, like, Mickey Hart and Bill Kreutzmann drum circle, you know? Uh, I mean, that's, you know, a lot, lot to be said in the name there, you know? So, uh, and then, you know, it's like there's other groups, too, so sometimes there's, like, races to the, uh, you know, the copyright office where, you know, there'll be... Like there was, there is apparently, there were apparently at one point three radiators, um, like one in the UK. Sometimes they're non-performing, so it's not a problem. But then, you know, maybe you become the bigger thing, and if they have registered the name, then it could be a problem. And then you try to be cute and add like the in front of it, and that doesn't work. Um, you know, maybe a descriptive adjective. Yeah, that, yeah. I mean that. Uh, I'm in the meter. I'm in. I'm actually in the original meters litigation. But uh, I guess the funky meters. I guess the ban has approved that use. Uh, but yeah, there's another. They have another one too, which is like Leo. The meterman. The meterman. Yeah, there we go. Now that one isn't approved. But you see, that one I think probably would have a hard time going after. You know, that's probably a new a new name. Um, that's definitely unauthorized. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's tough because it's inner family kind of stuff. But uh, 
but yeah. I mean, obviously the meters, you know, I work a lot with Superfly who owns Bonnaroo and they book, uh, I guess, Dr. John and the meters uh, to do the Bonnaroo record that Dr. John did years ago. But, you know, that's like a, I don't know, that's a lot, that's a, a very much a six-figure gig, you know, compared to maybe what Leo could get for the meters experience, you know, so. Um, Roger Waters. Yeah. Roger Waters just as Roger Waters performing the wall. The wall, yeah. Which is the Pink Floyd. Yeah, now they, he definitely had problems because there was two guys, the guy that died and another guy with the group name. They blocked, I know they had blocked initially any of the, the, uh, the, the, the use of the name. So, like I say, people constantly are trying different variations and permutations and, you know. Deep Purple, I know that one guy went out one time and he tried to use the name. And they, they actually sued and won that one. Um, and then of course then quickly reformed and, you know, uh, so. So you recommend that they have to try to Yeah, I would definitely, uh, I mean if you, uh, I, mean, I guess the whole thing is, is one problem is that if you don't do it and you put a lot of time and work and equity in the name and it's not protected, uh, I guess, too, without at least one doing a search, right, you might uh, then learn you have a name that you have uh, put time and effort into and then all of a sudden you got to change the name. And I've dealt with that a good number of times with, like, Stanton is in so many groups it's hard to remember, but he has something that was a night, like a gig in San Francisco, okay, at a venue, him and Robert, and two guys from San Francisco, and then everything was fine. They used this name of the night. I can't remember. Some astrological thing. And uh, so long as they played in that venue in San Francisco, everything seemed to be fine. And they played here and wherever. Then they got bigger. Well, guess what? They went to the next venue. Bam, I got a cease and desist letter, the first first gig they did. And so then we looked at, well, can we say formally the and whatever the, the problem name is, which we can't. I, I don't think we could. But uh, so it, you know, they had, you know, I remember having a meeting with them and it's like, look, we could fight this out. The guy's dad's a trademark lawyer, which isn't a good sign. Um, and again, y'all can keep putting money in, uh, equity in this name or you could just change the damn name because it had it only had gone on for about a year you know so then they change the name then of course like three years later the guys come back and say oh look I have no problems why don't you use the name again so I'm like oh this is a trick right you gotta still play this venue so well let's see if you'll give us a free license in perpetuity so y'all can use the name of course then he said no so I was like well don't change your name so you're going to be stuck back in the same situation. Um, yeah. What about the movement towards copyrighted words or trademarked words, like space and book? I mean, there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. I mean, can you get away with that? That's how it carries all the discovery. Yeah, I mean, they've definitely become, now that they... Uh, are seeing these kind of things that are going on. I mean, at first they were doing all that, and then now they've become, um, like right now I'm having a, a, a problem trademarking and service marking or copywriting. Copywriting's the easiest. So that, that one usually goes through. But for instance, Tromon Shorty, his group is named Orleans Avenue. And we're fighting with the trademark examiner on that. Like they think, well, you can't own the, the street name, you know? We're like, oh, no, it's descriptive of the band name. And then they're like, well, do you have samples of just the use of the name, the band name on its own? Which, of course, we're going to have to, like, generate all that. But they're... Uh, the negotiation with the trademark office? Yeah. They'll, uh, there's a trademark examiner that looks at all this and looks at the specimens, and, you know, they're very particular, you know? Because, I mean, some things, like, for instance... With Cupid, um, I actually got that name, and I, I really didn't think we would get it. 
you know, because then it's like, okay, like, I, you know, I'm like, he's got, so in an entertainment services category, you know, he owns the name Cupid. So, you know, I'm thinking, oh, well, it's kind of generic, right? And so now can I start sending out cease and desist letters to like Hallmark for sending Valentine's cards out or that kind of stuff? That's what they're kind of worried about, I think. Um, you know, so if it's just too plain and generic, that you know, there was a a case here with Steve Wynn involving juvenile uh, over the Cajun in your pocket thing, uh, and whether or not he could actually copyright these expressions, which were like laissez le bon temps rouler. And I think the court pretty much rightly decided, like, no, these are just generic expressions that he just can't own. You know. Could, yeah, the who that? Yeah, the who that thing is. I mean, I I represent actually one of the original one of the original session drummers on that. It was like Aaron Neville and a bunch of guys, that, and uh, I represent the drummer um, who got bought out a long time ago um, for a pretty good size of chunk of money. But yeah, I mean, it's you know you get into like, was well, it a common expression versus in kind of in the public domain versus yeah, like Paris Hilton like. It's hot. I mean, what do you mean? She can like send me a cease and desist letter for that? It just seems ridiculous, you know? I mean, I think if, if like in connection with a product and you, she identified what the product was, maybe that would be okay. But I think just the general term, and it just doesn't work for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, I do it a lot because one of the clients I have is Mahalia Jackson. So um, in the gospel world, she's like the most famous. Um, so I guess this issue, there are currently, I guess, 17 states that recognize publicity rights. Each state is a little different. So um, a couple, I guess a couple run-ins that I've had, a lot of, you know, it's come up all the time. I guess the most obvious one is, of course, with someone like Fish, um, the band will have all these bootleg t-shirt guys. <laughs> so if you register the name and the trademark, you know, that's, they own that. And, and that all floats into this publicity rights concept, which means that if you're using their name or their image or their likeness for commercial gain, then uh, under the publicity rights statute, you can't. So, there's lots of cases on this. It's, it's, it's kind of, if you can imagine, like the First Amendment fighting publicity rights, you know, which is basically like, so sh do I have the right? There, one big case was a, a Tom Waits case where Tom, Tom's a lawyer I'm pretty good friends with, but they had negotiated with, Frito-Lay had approached him about a commercial, and uh, it's either Tom Waits or Bette Midler, but both of them had the same kind of thing, where using an image, a gravelly voice kind of guy for a commercial. Tom said, you know, not enough money, I'm not going to do it. So they just got someone else to do it, basically. So they sued. So basically it's like, you know, is this something that sounds just like Tom Waits where it would violate? Now that's a little more closer call, but, you know, the practical issue I deal with is like people uh, either want to have a play and they want to use Mahalia's name, uh, Mahalia, um, you know, gospel festival. And, you know, ultimately for the estate, we recognize that, look, it has a value, right? We might be able to license that right to the Jazz Fest and call the gospel stage the Mahalia Jackson gospel stage or whatever. Um, or I'm working on a feature film owner 
So basically, you know, we've assigned our rights to the name, image, and likeness to these guys doing the movie. So, you know, they think they have a known something. And then if they have all these people bootlegging stuff. So, yeah, in the, in the, I guess in the real practical application of, like, in the Jack White aspect of the world, like, yeah, you've got bootlegging kids selling T-shirts. So, you know, or maybe it's just his name or his image on a T-shirt and that kind of stuff. It might not even say the group name. And they say, oh, well, we can use, you know, you look like somebody else kind of thing. Um, so there's, there's lots of cases on all that, and it is kind of, you know, your freedom of expression versus, you know, no, this is my trademark image, likeness. Um, so there's, there's been lots of cases on that. I'm kind of the more interesting lawsuit I'm involved in is um, when you play college sports, you sign a waiver, yeah. right, to, to the university, for instance, Loyola, everybody here, plays athletics, they say in exchange for a scholarship, basically trades a use of the name, image, and likeness to the university, licensed for free forever, which is, is fine if you're Shaquille O'Neal because you're going to go on and make tons of money in the pros and it just doesn't matter. So we have a class with David Boys as uh, one of the lead guys of people that, uh, my guy for instance was a Heisman nominee in the last game of the year. He got nailed and he's out for life. And he is like a, you know, he's like a bronze god at University of Alabama. And Alabama still sells his uniform. He's on the cover of the EA Sports game. He's currently unemployed and he gets nothing, you know. And, um, you know, they, the NCAA says that, you know, that's all in exchange for this scholarship, right? And we all know how hard the ath athletes are studying away and that valuable. Um, scholarship that they're on, but, uh, you know, that, that's a similar kind of thing where, you know, you're licensing your name and image forever for nothing, basically. But, uh, yeah, Louisiana doesn't have a publicity statute. I mean, the way I at least deal with it is, for instance, with Mahalia, I would write a cease and desist letter typically, but I say like, oh, you're conducting a play in that state that might have publicity rights, or maybe you're producing a television show that's going to be broadcast, or you're going to sell... CDs over the internet, which are based in a state that recognizes publicity rights, or are um, sold to a state that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a. You know, it's, it'd be great if Louisiana would adopt a publicity statute because it would give you know artists, I think, fair rights to protect their, their image and likeness. Um, but there, you know, New York, California, they all have pretty pretty solid publicity statutes that typically say that they, the estate may be, some of them give you a time period, like 50 years that they have the right. Some estates are very aggressive, you know, like if you, um, if you use Elvis's name or image, I'm promising you get a letter within two or three days. Um, Disney's obviously pretty aggressive on any of their things like that too, that they own. Does Tibetina pay the professor long hair? Yeah, there was uh, there was some action on that too, uh, and there was action on with the Jazz Fest because there was a Professor Longhair stage, but now they license the image uh, from the estate. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it is. Well. You could make an argument, for instance, that let's say um, the Jazz Fest might do broadcast of the festival out of state and it would land in a state that has publicity rights, right? I mean, without a statute, yeah. I mean, you, they could have just said, come at us, right? Uh, but they settled. Yeah, I mean, there's no statute here, that, so there's not really um, a requirement. Um, maybe if he was alive, it would make a little more of a difference, you know, but being that he's dead, he would definitely fall into the, the classic publicity rights. But, I mean, you know, it, it applies to people that are alive, too, you know. Can you create an estate post-haste? Well. After, like, after he's dead and, and something happens, like, the family gets together and, like, we have an estate. Yeah, I mean, they, you could, they could always probate like an estate whenever. So, you know, 
Um, yeah, I mean, there's always the issue of like who has those rights. That really just defines like who has the rights to, to maybe push on that. So. Um, now, when you sign away your, your name and likeness in a typical recording deal, um, have you had an occasion to soften that kind of uh, clause? And isn't that a part of every clause, every recording contract? Yeah, I mean, I guess typically uh, what I would look for is that one, you're not assigning it, right? That you're not giving it or selling it to them because then you're gonna get into that problem someone kind of the kind of Disney world. So this, uh, the better thing to do is basically just say, look, we're gonna give you maybe a license or the right to use our name, image, and likeness uh, perhaps forever. I mean, I guess usually kind of thinking through it, what I'm looking for is Maybe you have the right, they need the right to use your name, image, and likeness because you want the label, arguably, to sell CDs even after the deal's over, right? So they need it for that purpose. But, you know, kind of before the advent of the 360 deal and, and kind of with merch rights, that's kind of where, like I just went through this with Auntie on a deal where it was like they wanted what I thought were kind of broad rights on the use of the name, image, and likeness for marketing and advertising, and then kind of like a waffly kind of, almost sounded like merchandising purpose. So it's like, I'm fine with them putting our name on our own record to promote it, or on posters to promote it, or on ads, but I don't want the label to be able to use my band's name to put it on a t-shirt to sell it, especially if we have no deal about what we get. Um, so, I mean, I think that's the, the biggest kind of watch area is, like, I don't want to, like, A, sell it to someone, especially for nothing. Uh, I mean, basically, usually what I do is say, look, you got a royalty-free license to use the name or the image of the group, only in connection with this record, only when you have it, you know, in print, that kind of stuff. And it's not exclusive, so that way I can go get another deal. Um, but that, that is, like for instance, uh, I think of a group that did a pretty inventive, um, yeah, the Jayhawks, if you know who those guys are, that band, they had some problems. I guess it was, I don't know what it was, it was like the Jayhawks, the guy in Soul Asylum, is about four of these Minneapolis groups. Well, they all wanted to do a record together. So they were all in different labels. They all, labels, no. So then they said, well, so basically they formed a new group uh, called Golden Smog, okay? So a fictitious name, and each band member had a fictitious name, which is the first and last name of various streets they lived on, you know? Denny Lane, that kind of stuff, right? And all of them. So there's nowhere on the record that it actually identifies who the real people are. And, and that was a pretty... You know, that, that lawyer I know, he's a pretty creative guy to think of that one. Um, I've, I guess I've dealt with that a little bit with, like, we have, like, with Stanton again, he has, like, Garage a Trois is another offshoot where the label, like, you can't use, like, Stanton Moore of Galactic and da-da-da, so then we have another name, and then we can identify, like, featured artists and all that. But, you know, obviously there's a lot of value in the name, so that's why it's, it's important, you know. Um, I see a lot of that stuff with non-competes. After shows, yeah, yeah, front and back for a while. Um, yeah, that's there is, you know, which is kind of amazing is that C3, the Justice Department, is investigating for the, the radius clause for Lollapalooza. Which I hear, I was like, that's, that's crazy, but then I heard it's six months front and back of, in the whole region of Chicago for like I think 120 miles. Which, you know, if you tour in Chicago, that pretty much puts it off the market for a year. Um, so that, yeah, that's, and you could do it through a fictitious name, you know. <laughs> Might be one way around it. Um, yeah, that's. I have a, what about the, uh, this is a little bit different uh, off the subject, but there was a re the Supreme Court recently turned down the, uh, the case Yeah. 
it, well, I wasn't involved in it. Yeah, I know about it. Though. So the, the, the appellate court said that it's a license licensing deal. Yeah. So it's a 50-50 split in the older right. franchise instead of a 10 percent or 12 percent. Yeah. So that means all those legacy apps are going to get paid, probably pass down loads. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's kind of been. I really dealt with a lot more on ringtones, which it took us lawyers a while to figure out like what exactly is a ringtone? Was it a license or not? And what rate did it get paid? So that was like 12% versus 50-50 net receipts. I was getting 50-50 deals until Atlantic and whoever realized there's a lot of money in it and then all of a sudden changed to royalty bearing. Yeah. That was for a perspective. Uh, yeah. The yeah. But for all the older guys, all the guys who have countless deals where the licensing uh, split is 50 50, yeah. then they're going to be doing some money. Possibly. I mean, I mean M&M's going to be real big cash. Yeah. I mean, I guess the one concern I would have for the legacy acts is maybe no, they're not, because then it falls into the new media definition, which is even worse, which is like, you know. 25% of the least yeah. royalty bearing account. Uh, I've had that fight a couple times, you know, because it's like that's kind of like the dumping ground or like we don't know where to put it, so it's going to be in this, this area. And I think, and they do have, like in some of those older deals, they do have some kind of new media definition, so it could go into that. Um, you know, it's like I'm on the other side, I'm usually always on the artist side. I do have one. Uh, instance, I'm doing litigation for Warner Brothers here, and you know it's kind of funny just dealing with like we're thinking about creative ways to settle, and you know lawyers like, well, why don't we just raise all their royalty rates and give them another advance and do this and this? You know, I mean they were really very amenable to kind of changing some of that if you just maybe approached them. I think a lot of people forget about picking up the phone sometimes. So it's like we're gonna sue you, you know. Um, because they will sometimes be like, oh well, we, we're paying everybody this way now. Um, but at least now it seems like we're gravitating to getting some, some rates on ring, you know, now ringtones, downloads, all that kind of stuff. There, I mean, there should be just a defined rate. This isn't rocket science to figure out. Um, it's just, I guess, when we don't know what's coming, like, is this media going to, you know, it's like VHS versus Betamax or something, you know. Um, you don't really know what to do. You know, I mean, especially now, too, is like I always put another provision that says, look, if the new media becomes the standard, well, then there's got to be some way to get out of that new media definition. Um, that's definitely a big problem with all these album artists, you know, that didn't see CDs as coming, so they just got reduced to nothing, and then, but there was no way to get out of it, you know. Yeah, so that, I guess that keeps me busy, huh? <laughs> Job. So Yeah, typically, um, or maybe me or one of my other lawyers. Um, yes, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a hectic schedule and all that kind of crazy stuff. But yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I'm. A, yeah, I mean, like, um, what's something? What's kind of been a boondoggle around here recently? Treme, right? So that's like ten grand every band, right? So they used like one, one episode used 54 songs in one episode, I believe, which is really pretty amazing. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, you have all these people that are like some song that like the dude just heard at the jukebox at DBA one night and said, oh, this worked perfectly. And he, like he, Blake will get on it and like find who the writer is. And then they're like, of course, then they first of all think they're going to be billionaires, which I'm like, ah, it's not going to happen. But you might get 10 grand out of it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, those kind of things, one-offs. And also too, I mean, we get just tons of calls. I mean, this week has been, our, we've been joking in the office, it's reality week, because we have the uh, pawn porn reality show, I guess, some sort of pawn shop reality show. Yeah, pawn stars. Pawn star, yeah, there we go, pawn star, excuse me. So apparently they want to use someone around here. Uh, and then, of course, swamp fever, or swamp thing. Swamp people. Swamp People has now generated a, uh, 
I don't know what the name of the show, but it's like a crawfish farmer kind of thing. Uh, they're like, oh, they're like looking for crawfish farmers. And of course, they need music too for these shows. So then they're like, oh, I got the best crawfish tune you've ever heard. So we get some of those come in. Um, but it's good that at least they're calling us on the front end because I remember like with American Idol, when that whole thing hit, it was like, they called me, it's like, oh, I'm gonna be a star. I'm like, did you sign the paperwork? And it's like, All right. it's too late now because they own you for, or at least they own a third of you forever, I guess. Really? Yeah, it's a pretty brutal contract. It's, yeah, it's probably one of the worst contracts I've seen. It's pretty, uh, so yeah. Every person. Everybody. The, all, every person, if you want to go on camera, because the whole thing is, if you think about it now, they can make a, a show, apparently a whole episode, out of the outtakes of like who really sucked and who really, really sucked, right? Well, then guess what? They're going to put it on TV. They're going to make a lot of money. Everybody's got to sign a release. Yeah. One would think, yeah. Especially, too, because I do think the leverage people, um, I, I just don't know what, you know, Jennifer Hudson or whatever, I'm not sure they can really do much on it, you know? I mean, I guess they can, like, try to sue them for, like, contract of adhesion or something, but it's like, I don't know, you were, like, nothing, and then they made you something, and then now you're selling Carrie Underwood. I, I mean, I don't know, I haven't really heard reports of people being successful and making progress, you know? I kind of thought the cash money Master P deals were bad, but then I saw some of those and I was like, oof. But you know, I mean, they are making stars out of these people, I guess, to some degree. So, so yeah, I think it's always good to get somebody that knows what they're doing on the front end, because I, I tend to get a lot of calls on the back end of like, oh, now I've been offered a record deal. I mean, I've gotten, I mean, like, there was one kid from Louisville that, like, was homeless and had a really good voice. Like, he called me. You know, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people have called me. Just like, oh, I think I got this record deal, but do I have to really give them? I'm like, yeah, you have to give them, you know. I didn't know what I was signing, you know. I was under 18, you know, your parents signed it for you, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a, I don't know, you know. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I do, regardless if it's of me or John or whoever, I think it's good to at least, I mean, I will tell you this, that this whole area of law, I mean, if you think about it, okay, here's the concept. We're going to go in partnership, right? I'm the record label. So I'm going to give you basically nothing. The split's going to be like 90-10. Sound fair? You know? So... I often get a lot of referrals from lawyers and they're like, and then they're like, and it seemed like then like, this guy's got to like pay it all back to them. And I'm like, oh yeah, you got to pay it back before they get a don. So the contracts are definitely very unique, I guess. So sometimes then they come in and they're like, look at this, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. And I'm like, well, it's pretty much a standard deal, you know? So um, I just think because it's such an odd uh, creature that people don't really know, um, they're not really that familiar. I'm not saying that they're all, you know, good because now it's kind of funny. It's like everybody, or maybe I've portrayed the labels as being these big bad monsters, uh, but I can tell you, it's like honestly now I see more really terrible, 360 egregious indie deals than I do with the majors. You know, there's there seems to be at least a certain level of like we'll give you this, whereas you know with these indie guys, it's like. 50-50 joint venture, I own everything, 100 options, merch rights, touring rights forever. You know, it's the craziest stuff you ever wanted to read. So, um, yeah, I would be cautious, you know. And it's usually, like, with their buddy, you know. And, like, they, like, found some crazy form. And, like, look at this one. This one just, we get everything. Uh, so, yeah. What's up with uh, YouTube and putting things on the Internet? Um, fraught with problems. I don't. I mean, you know. Um, I mean, the whole thing is they don't. 
you know, there is the whole collection on the internet, which I will tell you from the BMI ASCAP perspective, it's definitely gotten better. You know, that, you know, especially, I guess not so much on YouTube type stuff, but, you know, in a lot of different formats, I'm seeing like streaming, like for the movers, like obviously there's lots of streaming of the show on the internet uh, and reruns that are streamed on the internet. And I do see a fair amount of royalty accounting for that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, YouTube's like the Wild West, you know. So that's, there's no real, f I mean, you know, there's been lots of lawsuits over it. And, you know, but, I mean, look, you have things as crazy as, you know, Ellen DeGeneres wasn't paying a licensing fee for, like, years to anybody, you know. Any band that the, the you know they do the dance thing at the beginning, they weren't being paid, and the bands that were playing weren't being paid. I mean, this is like on commercial television, you know. And then of course you got a class action, and now they're paying us. So, um, somebody else had a. Yeah, what's the market like? Um, well, I guess my general comment would be that, I mean, one thing I know is that music's not going away. Now, the vehicle that we use is definitely changed, and it will change. Now, my utility and all that, unfortunately, you know, the world is very litigious, especially the U.S. Uh, and there's always, you know, usually, I mean, the advantage the Internet has now offered is that you know, maybe some band that really didn't have a chance of getting exposure. Like Cupid was my first clear YouTube signing. That was a song he created, him and a guy, which became like a regional dance craze that they worked to radio themselves without paying anybody and then became a regional radio hit, which we forced our way into Clear Channel without paying anybody anything. And, you know, he got a deal on Atlantic out of it, you know. So that would have never happened in the past. So, I mean, I think that part of the business is really exciting because, like, you and me and whoever have a real chance. You could go start a label tomorrow and you could, you know, through whether it be a gimmick, you know, whether it be this baggy pants guy that then will launch an Internet site and then do updates and all this kind of stuff really can, you know, you can get exposure. Uh, but I mean, you know, still all these bands are getting in various joint ventures or partnerships with people. Uh, and it's, you know, people, I mean, bands have recognized that, you know, they're, they're much more of a branding machine. And so, you know, I mean, I mean, like for instance, just with Cupid, the sheer number of deals I've done for that song, whether it be with Hallmark for greeting cards to like, you know, that dancing fish thing, you know, they press a button. I mean, I've done five different deals of whether it be a Halloween thing or a Valentine's thing, and you'll be amazed at how many of these things sell. So, you know, there's all these other formats. I remember last year at South by Southwest in my hotel, um, one of the managers I deal with was the original road manager Metallica, and so I kind of know the band, and, and they marched. and. I'm like, what are y'all doing here? And they're like, we are going to do a rock band, you know, or whatever it was, like a game. This will sell more records than we've ever sold combined, ever, period. So obviously we're here to market and promote the video game. And that's, they played a little, I mean, I was like, when's the last time y'all played a club? And they're like, 10 years ago? I mean, they're doing like, you know, stadiums in Europe you know, 150,000 people, and now they're going to play at Stubbs Barbecue in Austin, Texas, you know, but if the powers that be want them to play, and, you know, I'm sure they paid them, you know, but, uh, but you know, here it was, they're doing, you know, so there's so many alternative avenues, like, you know, Galactic, we just did our, they just did their first complete 60 minutes of um, the music that'll be a uh, PlayStation 3 game called Infamous 2, and they did all the music, you know, for it. Um, so they kind of scored, I guess, the video game. So 
now, you know, there's so many different music applications, which, you know, maybe I'm not doing the standard record deal anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm still tremendously busy with lots of different deals, whether it be like licensing music to Swamp Thing, which I've done, to, you know, we got the theme song apparently to the new Cajun uh, Crawfish Farmer reality show. Uh, you know, to all those kind of things. I mean, just even in marketing and promoting, I mean, oh, there's so many advertisements that are using like really good music now, you know, or sometimes the band is the, that, you know, I mean, you see these Apple commercials where it's just the band, you know, and it's gotten to the point where big bands like U2 will do it for free because it's such good promotion for the band, you know, or Dylan, you know, for that matter. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think there's always a use for, um, uh, entertainment lawyer. I mean, like I say, maybe I'm doing more merchandising, sponsorship type things, or kind of things that aren't exactly, you know, what I was doing maybe five years ago. But, you know, and then there's certain standard things like, you know, bands are still hiring managers and booking agents, and bands are still getting in fights, you know, uh, and bands are still getting sued. Uh, kids are still ODing, apparently, and blaming the band. Uh, you know, so there's all that kind of stuff still still happens, you know. I'm interested in becoming a lawyer. Are you interested in becoming a lawyer? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I went to law school to be an environmental lawyer. I became slightly disillusioned. I was going to save the world, right? And then I had this moment in a big case where I realized that both sides lie. So. I don't know, I guess I became slightly disillusioned by that, you know, I was like, God, this is like, kind of like the expert to the environmental movement, and I was like, well, she's just as bad as a corporation, because she's totally lying, her testing sucked, and all that stuff. Uh, but I guess my peer group, a lot of them were artists, and at least for me, I realized there was a, a big opportunity in this whole region, right, meaning like from Austin, all the way down through Florida, let's say, because the, the way things used to work, I think, was if you became really successful or famous, then you had to hire a New York or LA lawyer. It's just the way it went, right? But there was always this disconnect. I remember talking to Buckwheat about, like, he signed to Island Records, right? I mean, they've got Bob Marley, and he was signed to that label with him, and you know, he's like, I got this fast-talking lawyer in New York. I don't understand a word he says. You know, he just really couldn't relate to his lawyer. Um, so basically, you know, I realized, wow, you know, this is true that, you know, the Nevels went to an out-of-town lawyer, Alan Tuzan went to out town you know, or they didn't use a lawyer, and certainly we have a wealth of a talent pool here. Uh, so... You know, I, you know, and I frankly, I see the same thing to some degree in Austin and Seattle and Minneapolis. Like, their infrastructure is lacking. You know, they've got a lot of talent, you know. So I was like, well, maybe I could make a career out of this, you know, so to speak. So, you know, I, I'm, I didn't really, in law school, I didn't take, I went to Tulane, actually. So I didn't really, they probably actually didn't have an entertainment course at the time. But I didn't even take, like, a copyright class. But... You know, I did learn it. You can go to CLE, Continuing Legal Education, and I learned more about, you know, some of it is just, like, contracts, right? I learned about that. You have to. Corporations, corporate law, that kind of stuff, because bands are corporations, right? So I learned about all that. Um, so, you know, I got in that way, and, uh, you know, I think there wasn't that many lawyers in this region that even do this. So, you know, now I've got two other lawyers you know, we probably spend at least 70% of our time, you know, just on, and it might not be just music, like I say, it might be film, or, and then we have kind of crossover people, which is, you know, obviously the rappers gave us this, man, they like are in, into everything, which is awesome, right? They're clothesline, we got, uh, we're in movies, we're endorsement deals, we're doing vodka, we're doing this, we're doing all that, which is, is great, you know, um, so that, that could be a full-time gig. So that's really kind of how I got into it. Uh, during live shows, um, a band can kind of pull the whiskey in the crowd, and you've also recently made use of fireballs. Do you still have that problem with this? Yes, you will get sued. I, get sued. Yeah. I mean, 
Oh, no, 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 don't. Someone at fault and someone being injured are generally irrelevant to a lawsuit, right? You know, it's just blame somebody with money. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, look, uh, you know, for instance, I do a lot of work with Lloyds of London. Lloyds will insure anything, right? So they will insure, they will write. I mean, a buddy of mine wrote reverse life insurance again on Michael Jackson. So it only would cover him if... He OD. So he said, I went to bed for six months every night praying homicide. And he's won so far, it appears. Uh, so usually drugs and alcohol would be excluded from life insurance. It's like basic.